Old Testament documents written in the name of another better known person have been called pseudepigrapha. A pseudepigraph is a book or writing bearing a false title or one that is ascribed to a writer other than the genuine author. Consider the first five books of the Bible, the so-called five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the written Torah. My friends, for non-fundamentalists, the five books of Moses, so-called, are pseudepigrapha. They were written by Persian scribes for immigrants to the Persian colony Yehud, only later attributed to Moses. So, pseudepigraphy means false attribution of authorship, or falsely attributing a writing to someone different from the actual author. A pseudepigraphic work is composed as if it were written by a person from the past, the attributed author, while the actual author was someone else, a person usually anonymous. The attributed author is usually either a famous person from the remote past, or the actual author's own teacher, who had died. Even though there is something quite false about any pseudepigraphic work, these documents shouldn't be called false writings. Pseudepigraphy says nothing about the value of the work's content, but only about the attributed authorship. Several ancient Israelite writings are attributed to various biblical figures, even though they could not possibly have been written by the purported authors, but rather by a much later anonymous writer who lived hundreds of years after. Traditionally, in the New Testament, the letter called 2 Thessalonians and other non-authentic letters of Paul have been dubbed Deuteropaulines, meaning secondary Paulines. These documents, though they claim to have been written by Paul, are pseudepigraphic and therefore are forgeries. A forgery is any piece of writing, according to the intention of its producer or producers, that purports to be something other than what it really is. There are two key elements to any forgery. Number one, Effacement of the document's real identity. And number two, the intention of the forger to deceive. The document we call 2 Thessalonians may not have been directed to the Jesus group or Jesus groups in Thessalonica at all. It may have been directed to second Pauline generation Jesus groups who were upset and confused by Paul's unexpected death. Remember, Paul had assured them that he would be alive when Jesus returned. However, Paul had died, and Jesus has not returned. Therefore, 2 Thessalonians may have been a circulatory letter addressed to many Jesus groups that were confused, and therefore all of them could have identified with Thessalonica. My friends, I gotta tell you, it indeed was the intention of the letter writer, the anonymous letter writer of 2 Thessalonians, definitely not Paul, to deceive the recipients into thinking that Paul wrote the letter. It's a forgery. Does that make the work invalid? Does that mean that 2 Thessalonians is not inspired? We should note that here validity has to do with an authorizing authority. For the written Torah, the Pentateuch, a Persian-appointed high priest or court prophet was the authorizing authority. Hundreds of years later, when we speak about the Pauline letters, the Jesus groups that agreed with the letters and kept them as special or normative in some way were the authorizing authority. Jesus groups preserved the letters not because they considered them authentic in the sense of being truly written by the reputed author, no, they deemed them authentic because the documents had authority to deal with relevant problems to their group that, group, that the group was experiencing, crises that the group was undergoing. The documents were authorized, and that's what made them valid and authentic. Authentic signifying genuine or of genuine authorship was a much later development of the word authentic.
you should note three important points about all forgeries. First, a forgery serves to validate the message within it. Forgeries assume the stable identity of genuine documents as a counterpoint to the unstable identity of other forgeries. So, 2 Thessalonians has the same character as 1 Thessalonians, a Hellenistic letter form. Some 19 verses in 2 Thessalonians replicate strings of words from 1 Thessalonians. Biblical scholars think that the forger used 1 Thessalonians as his model for his forged letter. More than this, the letter was recited in face-to-face -face communication. This was critical for the recipient's judgment of authenticity. The Hellenistic problem with documents, therefore, was not one of deception, fictionality, or false identity, because these are features of many documents, genuine and forged. Rather, it was one of authorization. Validity in assessing ancient documents derived from authorization, as we've just noted. A document could, on occasion, validate itself through the power, the credibility, and acceptability of its discourse or narrative. For example, the Qur'an is self-validating because it is beautiful beyond human linguistic ability. But there's nothing at all like this in the Old and New Testaments, which are messy. So validation for biblical works have to come from elsewhere. Second thing to note, forgeries are a means to textualization. The expectations and response of the audience or receiver is just as important as the forger's intention. So, for one thing, letters were said to be sent by and directed to very well-known communities and personages, well-known within Pauline Jesus groups, for example, Paul, Timothy, Titus, Silvanus, etc. Secondly, the senders of the letters were presumed to be alive by the forgers at the time of writing, and given the lack of ability to communicate immediately, as in texting or email, and these are ancient people, right? It would be a long time before a death got reported and known. And third, in the communities that accepted these letters, they had to sound as though they had come from Paul, as though they had come from Timothy, or some other Pauline change agent. These letters presumably textualize, with the approval of Paul, or the Pauline team, the behaviors in vogue in the groups receiving the letters. Finally, a last thing to note about forgeries. Forgeries are a means toward analyses. The producer of the forgery is usually an anonymous figure, a corporate sender, as was the case with most of Paul's letters, whether they were genuine or not. What this does is it causes the recipients to focus on the texts themselves. The community, the Jesus group, thus values and or requires these texts because they address their current concerns, crises, and problems. This is true of second and third Pauline generation documents, but it was also true for the Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Ascribing these anonymous documents to well-known figures illustrated God's abiding interest in and concern for all Israel, even those far away, living far off from Jerusalem. Such an understanding helps to explain the rich diversity of the traditions, the Judean and Hellene, civilized Israelite, that developed in these groups. Paul was a key figure, and even though he was, it is important not to forget that he had collaborators. Timothy, Silvanus, Sosthenes, Titus, among others. My friends, there is no big man view of history here. Moreover, contrary to the idea that Jesus founded Christianity and that Paul was the second founder of Christianity, so common in our spurious familiarity, the New Testament makes it quite clear that God, the God of Israel, is the founder of what would later become Christianity under Emperor Constantine. What was important was not Jesus' preaching of a forthcoming Israelite theocracy, the kingdom of God, so much as God's raising Jesus from the dead that validated his preaching. That was of paramount importance. 
So could a forgery be inspired? 2 Thessalonians is inspired. The authorizing authority, that is the church, has validated this.